Hello, everyone. It's James Black. I'm here with you today. I'm from the Canadian Securities Exchange and welcoming you to Tech Tuesdays. This is our fifth edition. And today's subject matter will be one that you may be familiar with if you've joined us in previous sessions, non-invasive medical devices. We had so much demand for these uh, these companies and so many great companies to share that we uh, decided to do it all over again, but with some very different companies. So to guide you in today's discussion, I'm going to introduce Mark Francis, who is my colleague out of Western Canada, specifically Calgary, Alberta. And uh, Mark will be our moderator today. And I just want to let you know that today's session is brought to you by CSE TV. Now, CSE TV is where you can catch all the replays of these sessions. It's where you can see back um, backdated sessions. So we've had four before this. And uh, if you subscribe today, you'll get auto automatic uh, updates of the new sessions as they come out. So if you miss any or you want to get this one, uh, and the reminder in your account, just subscribe. I put a link out in the chat. And without further ado, Mark, it's all yours. Thank you very much, James. And to all of you for joining us on CSE's Tech Tuesday. We run every Tuesday starting 15 minutes after market close, typically with three private companies at various stages from North America and abroad. Next week, we have food technology companies, Brew Ninja of Regina, software company for small breweries, and Knibble, I'll let you ponder that elision of two words, uh, of Tel Aviv. Our objective in running Tech Tuesdays is twofold. First, to help technology companies with increasing traction to gain relevant visibility, and second, to help capital markets players by introducing interesting companies, focusing on whether the technology will have commercial traction and why, and also providing new knowledge of what is happening in innovation. For you as attendees, we do ask that you share ideas and your feedback with our presenters, including leads, possibly funding after due diligence, referral of someone with applicable unique expertise, or maybe even a potential strategic relationship. You can find our presenters' information, contact information, in the chat board. With respect, we might refrain from giving management advice unless we are truly experts in the company's particular field. And please don't treat our presenting companies as marketing targets for services. So some housekeeping matters. You will note a red reconnect tab at the top of your screen. If you lose audio, just click it and you will be reconnected. In the event that there are technical problems, we may hit the restart, in which case there is no action required by you as the system will automatically reconnect everyone. We aim to run 45 minutes to one hour and the chat board may be utilized to ask serious questions. Please be clear as to whom your question is being addressed and don't clutter the chat board. We will try to get to your questions. Note our disclaimer. This presentation is for information only and is not a solicitation to make an investment in either shares or debt or to buy or sell stock. CSE and Mark Francis as session host, i.e. yours truly, make no representation about any of these companies. If you are interested in the investor pitch, please connect with the companies directly in order to get detailed information. Also note that I am an indirect investor in innovative trauma care and therefore could be seen as having a conflict. Each company will have a seven minute presentation with their PowerPoint. When you see my face appear, the company has 15 seconds to wrap up. After all companies have presented, we'll move to a panel discussion with Q&A, this time moderated by yours truly. Today we have as presenters, Ronan Gadot, CEO of Elminda, nominated by Yigal Arnon, a law firm in Tel Aviv with a substantive technology practice. Andrew Holman, CEO and co-founder of InMedics, nominated by Jolene Anderson of Kiretsu, and she runs the Boise chapter as well. And also Joe Brennan, CEO of Innovative Trauma Care, nominated by Valhalla Angels. So let's start with Ronan Godot. Ronan. So Ronan Gadot flew F-16s with the aerobatic team of the Israeli Air Force, worked at Silicon Valley-based Applied Materials, and later became a founding member of the Philips Corporate Venture Capital Fund, bringing to market one of the first digital health technologies in home telemedicine. Ronan, take it away. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. 
You know, our brain health and mental state is such an important part of our well-being. There has never been actually a more relevant time to personally feel it and find better ways to take care of it. So we at Elminda developed the BNA platform. BNA stands for Brain Network of Treatment of Brain-Related Disorders. Our mission is really to replace the current practice of exhaustive trial and error process of treating, selecting treatment and managing treatment of brain-related disorders with advanced signal processing. So actually turning art into science. One example, which I will elaborate more, is uh, depression patients. About 70% of depression patients fail to remit with first treatment, and it takes a long time before they know it. So our solutions are results driven. We're trying to improve outcomes, to reduce costs and to save lives. We focus initially on depression because it's such a, ba it's such a big uh, matter, such a big burden. More than 300 million people in the world are suffering from depression. And this is pre COVID-19. Number one leading cause of disability and very low efficacy rates. And what a lot of people don't really know that this disease actually kills. So mortality rates of depression is pretty high and equivalent to other um, cancer types. Uh, so this field really requires a lot of disruption in order to reduce costs and save lives. Now, when, I, when we say that there is no good health um, without brain health, this uh, slide actually emphasizes it very well because 60% of the healthcare costs are driven or associated with the 23% of the population who have behavioral health issues. So if you have behavioral health, you probably also will drive other uh, costs related, uh, cost related to health. So what we do, we directly interface with your brain through available hardware. So we have not developed any new hardware. Uh, and we are using a cloud-based AI platform and a very large database that we have collected over the years to translate these complex brain signals into actions. So how the system works, how brain network analytics works. So the first part is the measurement part, again, interfacing with existing devices with a very specific test paradigm in order to make it consistent. Everything is uploaded into the cloud for analysis. There we're using algorithms as well as over 600,000 recording from individual brains in order to compare and contrast to all the labeled and clean data. And then a report which is actionable for the physician to be able to take action. So when we look at depression, what is the current uh, standard of care and what is the challenge? The challenge is to quickly find the right treatment and get each patient well. When you look at how practice is being done today, the chances of a physician to select the right treatment the first time is actually less than 30%. And it takes a long time before you know whether the medication is working or not, sometimes six to eight weeks. Within these six to eight weeks, 50% of the patients actually drop out. And those who stay, 63% of them are switching medications until they find or don't find the right treatment. <clears throat> so it's an exhaustive process which involves a lot of trial and error, very frustrating for both the physician and the patient. So what is it that we do? Our solution addresses both the first part of it as well as the management. The first part is a brain assessment, is brain functional assessment, that the result of it is a report that recommends to the physician which treatment this particular patient is more likely to respond to. And by that, we can increase the predictive value from less than 30% to over 75% percent positive and negative predictive value. This product is not yet approved for clinical use uh, and it's in pivotal studies. The second uh, product, which um, we call um, uh, BNA for disease management, is addressing the, the time to treatment. So it's a functional assessment tool that actually looks at patient respond responses, brain response to medication, and we can see it way before the clinical effect. So this is really changing the dialogue between the patient and the doctor, significantly increase adherence and also increase efficacy rate. This product is already approved for clinical use in various uh, regions of the world. So it produces better outcomes than, the, than most available tools today. If we look at the best in class, which is genetic testing for uh, guiding treatment, 
we see improvement of over 44% as compared to treatment as usual or the standard of care. So with BNA guidance, guidance, we can show twice as likely to change the disease states, the physician will be able to change the disease state with proper and effective management of the patient. We ran over the last two and a half years, a large pilot to demonstrate the operational efficacy as well as reimbursement business model with over 12,000 patients. We validated all of, the, all of uh, the above, and we showed how customers can actually generate revenues with a very clear value proposition, improving the outcome for the patient, as well as generating a new revenue source that was previously unavailable for the physician. We're running this pilot for with over 300 patients per month. One of the things that we're still missing is extension of our labeling from younger ages that we already received, age 14 to 24, to all ages from 12 to 85. And actually next week, we are submitting a very large application to the FDA, which includes a very large database of almost 200,000 data sets. And we expected clearance within this year that will allow us wide marketing in North America. We have created the go-to-market plan timeline, which uh, includes the FDA submission, <clears throat> the clearance, and we expect some revenues already this year from, from this effort as, uh, and, in, and significant increase in revenues and next year. We also work with some strategic partners and reference sites that have been working with our tool for quite some time, from health systems like the Villages Health in Florida, and private clinics as well as large hospitals and work with some key opinion leaders from the field from Harvard Medical School, UCLA and others. We also plan to start some pilots with leading centers uh, beginning of next, next year with the Mayo Clinics, UCLA and Harvard Health. We have a very rich pipeline that how to transition this technology into home use and we're working on that for next year. So just to summarize, we are addressing one of the biggest healthcare challenges of our time with precision medicine. The current COVID pandemic creates some opportunities for us. A lot of investment uh, was done in the, in the company in order to de-risk, find the right product market fit while creating one of the largest data lakes of its kind for brain health. We market tested and validated and, and with available reimbursement and we are ready for commercial execution and seeking strategic partners as well as uh, investment at uh, the best risk reward terms. Thank you and uh, looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Ronan. And by the way, thank you for coming on late at night uh, from Tel Aviv to join us. Now we'll have Andrew Holman. Dr. Holman has validated innovative solutions for some of the most challenging unmet clinical needs, including pain, fight or flight stress and immunology. As a rheumatologist, Dr. Holman specialized in autoimmune disease, fibromyalgia, and hypermobility syndrome treatment and research for 25 years. Delighted to have you, Dr. Holman. Well, thanks very much. Uh, uh, you know, I, I'm a clinician, and um, uh, I founded uh, in Medics in Seattle, and we're bringing diagnostics as well as therapeutics to answer what's really fundamental face-to-face uh, -to, -face to patients. Uh, you know, why do patients respond differently to the same treatment? This is something that, that all of us have asked if we're in the waiting room. So my patients uh, you know, compare notes in the waiting room. In the US, of course, we have HIPAA requirements and, and they come into the office later and they say, well, how, how come I'm not doing as well as Mrs. So-and-so? Of course, you know, I can't talk about somebody else, some other patient, uh, but it's very, very, big issue, uh, and we're all concerned about this. It turns out that the answer has been discovered, but we haven't been able to apply the answer to the problem until now. We, you probably guessed the answer. Stress, um, it doesn't cause every disease, but it makes diseases untreatable and, and excessively active. It doesn't matter if it's heart disease or diabetes or psychiatric disease or my field of immunology. It turns out stress drives these diseases to excess. So we've been working on this for 20 years. Uh, and so the thought was, can we turn the soft science of stress into a hard science of biology? And the answer is yes. And next, can we find a way to measure stress accurately like a blood pressure cuff? And then can we mitigate it to get current medications to work properly and can we reduce costs? So 
you might be surprised that any one of these would be important, but we've done all of them. So how do you measure stress? There's a fairly technical discussion here. Uh, we'll use something called heart rate variability. We look at the beat to beat variation of at rest. When you, when you inspire, your heart rate accelerates. When you uh, expire or exhalation, it, it uh, decelerates. That's called heart rate variability and it disappears under stress. So this is, can be a cardiovascular test to measure important brain function controlling fight or flight stress. The problem is, is there's a lot of raw noise uh, in the data, there's poor reproducibility and there's actually no measurement in the current HRV to measure fight or flight activity. What in medics has done is groundbreaking with its 20 years of research is we now have proprietary algorithms that can measure that fight or flight component. Again, just like a blood pressure cuff. We have a precision ECG measurement. We advanced filtering of the raw data, which is essential. And we've done clinical validation and a cloud platform uh, to bring this to, to the market. So this is an EKG, you've seen this before. The average heart rate, it takes about a, a heartbeat takes about a half a second. For, uh, for a live, for a, um, a cardio mobile and for Apple to screen for heart to for atrial fibrillation, you need to discern this uh, EKG uh, uh, beat at about 0.1 second. To do what we do, you need to have a measurement that's accurate to one one thousandth of a second. So it's a completely different discussion than what you've seen on TV. Uh, medical grade ECGs sample at 250 to 330 hertz. We sample in the industry leading 8,000 hertz, which is essential for this technology. We also look at how noise needs to be filtered. And what you can see here from going one, two, three, four, or as you'll see how a filtering process can, can refine the data. And that's essential. And that's the secret sauce here, 30 years of refining this ECG data, which is all proprietary to make this thing really fly. So our innovation is called the ANS NeuroScan. We combine the original HRV that you may have heard of and seen before with this next generation HRV. And this product is already used in professional sports, messy trains with it every day. It's used by US Special Forces training. But we got a chance to work with it over the last 15 years and did nine clinical studies in over 300 patients, which is really the only reason you should be listening to me. You know, does this really have legs? We also produced a cloud-based platform to transform how clinical diagnostics are done. Some tests cannot be measured with a blood test, uh, maybe someday, but not now. And stress is one of them. Uh, so basically we process this in the Azure cloud. It's a five minute ECG done in the doctor's office. It communicates with an iPad and it communicates then with the Azure cloud and return instantly to the doctor to make clinical decision. There's no blood draws, there's no uh, delays, there's no toxic waste, there's no massive infrastructure of clinical labs, there's no, uh, none of the uh, low margins. Uh, it's a very simple business. We put this in the doctor's office for $6,000 a year. Current codes will give them $91 to do the test, 64 for us. And because we think this is going to be used about, about every three to four months uh, in patients, and this is based on market research that we've done, it's about $150,000 new revenue for the doctor and about $100,000 for us per unit placed. So we're starting with autoimmune disease. We're the most expensive doctor and we get the worst outcomes. We spend 25 billion on 5 million patients with rheumatoid arthritis and autoimmune disease, yet only 25% have adequate results. And this is why it, it's a concept called immunoautonomics. We coined the term, it's in the medical literature. On the left is a person with inflamed joints, but if you stress them, it blows up and it makes my treatments basically not work. So here's what we've done and here's why you should be listening to me. We've done a prospective double blind study already showing that this test of stress is the only test that predicts uh, response of rheumatoid arthritis 52 weeks in advance. We've tripled the rate of remission and patented this uh, using restless leg drugs. We got those drugs on TV that give you 25% remission. We got that to 79%. And we're also notable because independently we've been projected by the University of Washington, health economists to reduce the cost of care in the United States by up to 35 billion over 10 years. How? By we can predict drugs that will not work and we can get cheaper drugs to work better. So patients get better outcomes. They take less toxic drugs. I get to be a better rheumatologist. Uh, we have a challenging job and I get a new revenue source to help pay the bills and it moves the needle for us. And payers for the first time have a lifeline to, to, to reduce costs and improve care in the most expensive field of medicine, which is autoimmune disease. 
It's a two and a half billion dollar opportunity. We have a round open now, and I can talk about that uh, offline with people. We're targeting 3,800 rheumatologists, but you can imagine there are other doctors who want to measure stress as well. Uh, we're raising funds to do our next inflection point. We are a non-risk class two device with a predicate. We expect to file uh, next spring uh, and then launch next year uh, in the Pacific Northwest with another $2 million raise. So I want to thank you very much. Uh, this is a groundbreaking technology uh, for someone like me. I think uh, we all know stress matters. Now you're going to have a blood pressure cuff for it. Some people call this the sixth vital sign. The key is you can do something about it, get better outcomes and save money. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Holman. Thank you, Andrew. And now we, our last presenter, Joe Brennan. Dr. Brennan has been in the medical healthcare industry for the last 25 years after a successful tenure as a US military officer. Joe first led neosurgical, resulting in a successful sale and is now leading innovative trauma care. Joe. Thank you, Mark. Um, and my mother would be proud of me if I was a doctor, but I'm not. So uh, I just wanna make that clear. So innovative trauma care, uh, as you could see from this uh, graphic picture uh, meant to get your attention, what we do as a company is we work on hemorrhage control. So the leading uh, cause of preventable death and traumatic injury is bleeding to death. Uh, medical equipment is very limited. Uh, the number one used uh, device is a tourniquet, which has been around for centuries. Although it's easy to understand a concept, it's very hard to use. Uh, you'll see an overriding uh, number of pictures from military medicine because that's where we have uh, made our biggest push, and I'll talk about that as we go along. But as, uh, as things have changed in the world, active shooter scenarios, different things like that, uh, oftentimes uh, a first responder is not a paramedic, a fireman, a policeman, it's oftentimes other people on the scene. So it's important to have very easy to use tools uh, that work very well. So the IT clamp is a solution for hemorrhage control. This is used on any compressible space. So it could be used anywhere on the body with the exception of the chest and abdomen. So what it does is it simply forms a watertight seal on the skin. There's a picture of it on the top left. It also has eight suture needles, which uh, help seal it and two pressure bars. So uh, different than staples or sutures, which take a long time to apply, this is applied very quickly and is watertight where those two are not. So it simply forms a clot underneath the wound and uh, it forms a clot underneath and the back pressure stops the bleeding very quickly. So why is the IT clamp different? It can literally go from packaged to applied in under five seconds. We typically see an average of 10 seconds. It's easy to use. Training on the device takes under a minute. Uh, we've also seen a uh, very good uh, recall with a device when people have not used it in a year. Uh, they typically remember it very well. I talked about the eight suture needles. The suture needles are uh, close together, so you actually feel like you're using it, uh, just have one needle going in. So it's similar to an IV. I've put it on myself 40 or 50 times and uh, uh, maybe I'm a glutton, but it works very well. It doesn't, uh, it does not uh, cause a lot of pain. And it's easy enough to use where if someone places it in uh, very fast, you can reset it. You can use it, it is a single use device, but uh, you can use it uh, multiple occasions on the same patient if needed. So there's obviously a big market. We talked about the US military. There's 1.3 active duty military members in the US alone. That doesn't include reservists or National Guard, which almost doubles that number. So what we looked at is, you know, just if you gave, if each uh, service member, active duty service member had two IT clamps in their IFAC, which stands for individual first aid kit, that would be $91 million to stock you would use 20 to 25% a year just based on they have a five year, they have a six year shelf life, but once they're, by the time they're in the IFAC and the person has them, they change those out every five years. So you get a 20% uh, turnover guaranteed, then plus usage and training and uh, lost devices and broken devices. You could see uh, get over well over 20 million a year. The US 
the North American markets, $237 million. And the international market, the uh, Europe, the Middle East and Asia is closer to uh, 330 million. So I don't know where the 900 million came from. That is a mistake. But obviously a wide market. Um, this can only be used by, like I talk, EMS and fire, but also uh, a number of people we know keep it in their car or on their person as they uh, do different um, hazardous things, hiking, hunting, fishing, things like that. So here's some uh, more graphic pictures. The talk shows where it can be used, and they've been used in all these different places. Uh, you oftentimes think of, you know, just bleeding on the extremities, which tourniquets have become the number one go-to, but uh, this is a little more functional and that can be used in different areas, uh, especially above the shoulders. So neck, scalp, and face, which you can't use a tourniquet. You could also use in the axilla or the groin, the buttocks, and also works very well on the extremities, as you could see in the different pictures. And we have over 29 different clinical studies showing uh, the efficaciousness of the product. So our big push for the last four years has really been to go after the COTSI, which stands for the Committee on Tactical Combat Casualty Care. So that's a group of 140 individuals um, that are part of the US military. There is some international component and they have really tried to upgrade medicine because when the war on terror started in 2001, people were still using Vietnam era medicine. So they uh, have done a lot of research, a lot of training, and they approve products for the US military to order. So this doesn't just affect the US military, they're considered globally as the preeminent voice on pre-hospital trauma care. So um, once they approve a device, it often goes into um, the different guidelines for different organizations. So different EMS organizations, different fire police, foreign militaries uh, in Europe, and also the civilian, um, civilian uses, usage as well. So it was published in the JSON, which is a journal of special operations medicine. Uh, you ask, you know, how do we get it used if it's not approved by the military? The special forces folks get a little uh, wider latitude to order what they need. Uh, we've really focused on this and we got overwhelmingly approved at our last, um, the last meeting they had in September of last year. Um, there's a combat research trauma group, which is really growing uh, to their main focus is just, they look at products to use. They are kind of the, uh, the trial or um, the go-to organization to try the products to see how they're gonna work and hold up. They were just awarded last month. Uh, we just got word a couple of weeks ago. Um, they did a trial on the IT clamp and it was awarded the number one uh, for life saving research. So we we're excited about that. And it's obviously up the number of uh, inquiries you get from the military and civilian agencies. So with the U.S. military, we don't go directly to the U.S. military. There's a uh, network of military distributors. We've used Combat Medical, which has uh, two former tier one army medics that use the product. Uh, we've gone, we've done very well in the special forces. You could see where we're getting utilization in the different branches, uh, primarily the army and special forces, the commercial plan. We have trials set up in Los Angeles, San Diego and Phoenix. Uh, we are a little hampered by COVID until we can uh, get in and have live meetings to show them and demonstrate utilization. Our forecast is rapid growth in both military and civilian. Uh, our, our goal is in 2021 to pass the 3 million mark to make ourselves self-sufficient. Uh, we are doing a current C raise, just 1.5 million. That will take us to profitability. And like I said, military and civilian interest and adoption have picked up and uh, Thank you, Joe. Thank you, let me know. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much, Joe. So uh, now we'll bring back all of our panelists for the Inquisition, although it won't be uh, that tough. And uh, let's start with each of you talking a bit about why you co-founded or joined your current company. And, and let's go Ronan, Andrew, and, and Joe. Okay. Uh, first, I really like challenges, and um, there is no bigger challenge than our brain. 
But uh, also brain-related disorders have been a huge issue, more than 2 billion people suffering from brain-related disorders. And, and just in my family, I have two grandmothers uh, who suffered Alzheimer's disease, a grandfather and a mother with Parkinson's disease, a sister with fibromyalgia, two kids with ADHD, uh, a personal thing to try to find better ways to, um, um, to change the paradigm of this trial and error in brain-related disorders. And, um, and I joined initially as, a, as an investor. And two years later, uh, I, um, I um, uh, started uh, to um, increase uh, my uh, position in the company until I uh, took over and managed it. You want me to jump in there? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay, very good. Thanks, Mark. Well, uh, as I said, I'm a clinician, so we've got people in front of me uh, who aren't doing well. And uh, most people don't realize that rheumatology has a nickname. It's called the Consult of Last Resort. Uh, usually go see a rheumatologist when you have no idea what the problem is. Uh, we founded the company in 2006 to hold patents. Uh, we were solving our own problems. Uh, we've already found medical value, sold some of those patents for $10 million, uh, and now we're on to the next thing. Uh, it's, it's just simply a matter of necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, you got to do something with, when you only have one in four patients doing well. And I joined uh, Innovative Trauma Care for a pretty simple reason. There is a need for a product like this. I had served in the military. A number of my friends were still in the military. I saw what was happening to people, saw the opportunity for the product, obviously reached out to a number of people I knew and uh, got very positive feedback on the device, the technology. And that's why I started with the company six years ago. Okay, good. So let's talk a little more about the technology. Um, First of all, what technology do you trends do you see which will assist in the adoption of your own technology? So whether it's your your customers or others, and uh, let's start with Andrew this time, and and then go Joe and Ronan. Okay. Well, most people don't realize when you're a doctor, you're under the thumb of every uh, government and, and uh, insurance uh, company there is. If you don't perform. You cost too much. You drop from the panels, at least in the United States, and you don't have any patients. So, um, so we actually found a way to reduce costs, get better outcomes, and provide a revenue source to rheumatologists. So any one of those would be a problem, good for us. Uh, it comes down to the web. The web enables this opportunity. And for us, what is assisting us with the technology is obviously uh, awareness of um, the U.S. military, what they've done with this committee. And then, as we've seen the world change with many more active shooter incidents, people are putting hemorrhage control kits next to AEDs. Uh, right now, they're not standardized at all. They're not easy to use. They're just kind of thrown out there as a resort rather than uh, tactically training. The U.S. has started something called Stop the Bleed campaign. But again, it's not as centralized as you would think. So. Uh, ours is awareness, and unfortunately, the need for a product like this has become more and more evident. Yeah, for us, mental health, um, we came to mental health uh, only in the last three years uh, because we realized that uh, there is a huge need, uh, there is a shortage of providers, actually, in mental health. And uh, in the last uh, half, six months, it became a really a prominent problem because of the uh, pandemic, and we see a large increase in demand for people who require uh, more attention uh, for optimizing their treatment. Uh, but what we really change, the technology that can really change the paradigm and, and democratize the use of, um, I would say, brain network analytics is wearable sensors. Wearable sensors, and we have been working with uh, some universities to develop very easy to use and cost-effective wearable sensors so we can bring this to home use. Once you can bring it to home use, then um, uh, you really improve access to care and significantly improve uh, outcomes as well as reduce uh, healthcare costs. So wearables, efficient wearables for the brain. Okay, good. So Ronan, let's stay with you. Uh, and and uh, what technology trends do you see in your own technology going forward? How will you be, how do you foresee changing and adapting your own technology? And, and I guess your AI platform. Yeah, so um, as, as you know, we see a, a huge trend in the G digitization of healthcare uh, with uh, data, with a lot of data 
And so this is actually what driving uh, the future of our technology, the ability to access a lot of data because the, in particular in brain, the brain is so complex. It takes so much time to figure out and the variability between individuals is so large. So in order to figure that out, you really need a lot of data. So the reason also it took us so long uh, to get to the market is because we had to, we, uh, we spent like, $40 million in about a decade to collect over 600,000 recordings from individual brains. But um, the, the data gathering and the ability to get clean data is accelerating with time, which enables us to, um, um, to figure out and get much more insights, clinical insights, and develop more applications with the growth of these data. And right, I'll, go, I'll go next. Okay. Yeah, sure. So we look uh, for other applications for our device. One is uh, oftentimes a chest tube is placed in the field. It's very hard to suture in place. Our clamp is an excellent device for that. Once we have clinical evidence, you know, obviously we've used it, but haven't done the full blown trials for uh, FDA or CE approval or Health Canada. Also, we look at a smaller streamlined IT clip, as we call it just uh, to make it less apparent. So if someone uh, could put it on and still wear a hat, a helmet, whatever it may be. We also, since we've been through this process, it's amazing how many uh, new companies come to us with ideas. So we look to add to our pipeline in that way because we've kind of been through the ringer and could hopefully help uh, new technology get adopted a little quicker and cost much less than it cost us to get to this point. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I wasn't sure about the dance card order there. It switched up a little bit. Uh, you know, imagine imagine transforming a, a clinical laboratory into the cloud. Uh, ECG-based biomarkers, EEG-based biomarkers, facial recognition biomarkers, uh, thermography. It goes on and on. There are many things you can measure uh, very well without blood tests. Uh, and then once you have that massive data in the cloud, uh, the panel is completely right. Uh, you can then call that data to find answers to the problem that you're identifying. And what will be coming to medicine is entire divisions of pharmaceutical companies dedicated to finding uh, small molecules to block the epinephrine adrenaline response and the fight or flight response. So it no longer causes the heart attack, act, increases the blood sugar, affects the depression, insomnia, and pain, and wreaks havoc on the immune system, both in cancer and autoimmune disease. So we are leading that charge. And so again, we're a diagnostic company but we're intent and already filing patents on new therapeutics in this field called immunoautonomics. Well, I think for each of you, this I'm, it, it sort of begs that I should skip therefore to the, the last question I had for you. Looking two to five to 10 years out, is it your intention to be acquired by a larger entity or is it to build your business as an independent company? So we're building the company to build value for an IPO because of the platform and the nature of what we're doing. But imagine when the tech companies who are skilled with data start to understand the prospect of getting paid per test rather than a license for their technology. So we see the acquisition most likely with Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, and Verily, uh, when they get in the healthcare business in a serious way, where they actually start providing uh, uh, benefits. So that's, uh, that's where our exit is probably gonna be planned in the next two, three years. It's a conversation with the board all the time. It's, you know, what is the exit? And uh, my standard answer is if you build it the right way, you have options. So, uh, you know, we look to build it into a company with numerous different products. However, our, uh, our leading shareholder is a VC company. So you know what their vote will be for, right? But uh, it's, it's, fun, it's uh, fascinating that this pre-hospital trauma field is not dominated by any company's major companies. What will it take to get a Johnson & Johnson or a 3M, something like that, interested in consolidate all these different products and really drive these uh, hemorrhage control kits, these first aid kits to standardize, and then there's one training platform. So there's a great opportunity for one of those companies. I'm not saying they're going to do it, but uh, I could also see that happening. Okay, I, uh, I echo what Andrew actually said. So we, we are building the company for sustainable growth and uh, we believe that the growth of the data will, will bring a lot of value to what we're doing and we will get uh, the interest of many players in the data area. But uh, our philosophy that uh, if we will build a company for sustainable growth, opportunities will come, whether an IPO or an M&A, 
uh, but first we need to be um, sustainable. Driving revenue growth or at the expense of profits or focusing on early profitability? What is your choice? So at the stage that we are uh, revenue growth, revenue growth while containing costs. Um, so uh, revenue growth and uh, commercial traction is uh, what we are interested to show right now as we are uh, starting our uh, commercialization uh, in North America. Yeah, we're doing the same thing. Uh, we're, we're, uh, our, our margins are very, uh, uh, very good. And so we're trying to build a, a, a national launch from a regional launch. Just like Amazon did, just like uh, just like Microsoft did, following the lead of other Seattle companies. Yeah, uh, we're just uh, we're working to drive obviously revenue as well to be sustainable, but uh, as we drive the number of manufacturing costs will drop pretty dramatically with volume. So then you're you're looking toward earlier profitability as a result. Yes. Okay. Good. Well, let's now uh, switch. We've talked a bit about profitability and, and a couple of you have commented on a next round. So uh, let's give you a shot to, to say explicitly what you're looking to do in terms of raising capital in the next six to 12 months. Uh, Andrew, let's start with you. Yeah, we've got a current round up and now uh, I'm the lead investor. This is a uh, preferred equity round. Uh, Kritsu uh, helped uh, lead some of this as well as me. Uh, it's a uh, $5 million raise for a $7 million pre-revenue or, or, or yeah, yeah, pre-money valuation. Uh, we've got about two and a half million left and it'll take us to the next inflection point of FDA submission and uh, just launching right into commercialization next year. Yeah, we also have a current raise going on. It's a small round. It's a uh, 1.5 million just to take us to profitability. It's a, a Series C and uh, with a pre-money valuation of 12 million, uh, the uh, round will basically own 11% of the company. And uh, we are um, uh, in the process, started to, uh, to raise uh, 10 to $15 million. Uh, this will be post our FDA submission, uh, which will actually happen next week. Um, and our goal uh, with this round, the use of proceeds, is actually to set up uh, our uh, sales team that we started already to recruit in the U.S. commercial team and prepare ourselves for uh, the commercialization. We have already a very rich pipeline of uh, potential customers, uh, in particular in the psychiatry and neurology fields. Okay, well, you know, we're right at the top of the hour. and We tell people we try to run 45 minutes. So uh, I think we will close on that on that point and uh, uh, your, your capital raises. We might try and convince your Ronan to uh, come to the CSE way uh, and we can talk to you about why. Uh, thank you very much to our presenters. Ronan Godot of Elminda, Andrew Holman in Medics, Joe Brennan of Innovative Trauma Care. And thank you to our attendees for your time today. Do go to the company websites and learn more about these companies. And if you have a lead for them, do connect. Let's bring back James Black, Vice President of CSE for closing remarks. Yeah, thanks Mark. And uh, thanks, you didn't see her today, but Grace was uh, working magic behind the scenes. Grace Pedota, also with the CSE. Thanks gentlemen for your uh, your time today, for your knowledge. We look forward to seeing uh, you all in the near future, hopefully uh, with many more successes behind you. And uh, Mark, thanks again for your hosting. And if you're watching today, you want to keep up with all of these sessions, join the replays or on CSE TV on YouTube. I will send a link to you as soon as the session ends. And uh, we're back again next Tuesday. So back on uh, Tuesday the 18th, is it? It can be uh, 4.15 Eastern time. So we're back here. And I believe indeed. it's food tech, right, Mark? Yeah, indeed. So thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next week. Thanks again, everyone. And I wish you a good day.